right. Amen. We've been doing a study on new creation realities. I'm glad you made it today. You notice the weather is definitely changing. It's definitely autumn. I don't use the word fall anymore because my doctor used to use that when I come to church, come to the doctor's appointment. First thing that the assistant does is takes your temperature, checks your blood sugar, and then says, have you fallen? <laughs> what is it with old people? You know, have you fallen yet? We're betting. We're betting. <laughs> it's good to have humor, isn't it, sis? It's good to, have, to laugh and have a good time before the Lord. Amen. So we've been studying about new creation realities. And basically, we're going to call this one getting the most from your walk. How to get the most from your walk with God. Not being religious. But when you're walking with the Lord, the Bible says that we walk with Jesus every day. Well, we have Jesus in the heart because we asked him to come in, right? How many here asked Jesus to come in your heart? Quick, pan them all with the camera. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. Don't do that. <clears throat> that means everywhere you go, God is. And if you think about it, isn't he omnipresent? Yes. That means he's always present. He doesn't go anywhere. So wherever you go, he's in you and also he's around you. Can you say amen? So we've been... been Teaching, we want to teach today how you can get the most from your walk. Sometimes, whether you know this or not, Christians don't realize that you have four seasons. Did you know there is a season for everything? Sure, it says in Ecclesiastes, you know, a time and a season for everything. But Christians have a season. So let me throw it out to you so you can understand what you go through. Because there are certain times that really God seems like he's doing nothing. You ever had a time like that? Wave your hand at me. That he is doing something, but you can't really sense him like you did before. That's why it's not that important for you to compare your relationships and experiences of God with things that you expect of him for the future. You know, so I just came out when I was saved. I was saved in one of the greatest revivals that went worldwide. It was a charismatic revival. I got saved in with the anointing of God, was prayed in by all those faithful prayer warriors for years and years and years and years. And that revival broke loose and we seen programs, TBN and CBN and all of these things break loose and God seemed like God was everywhere. Then all of a sudden something happened, it was like a blanket that came down. And I'm, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to some people so you understand that. And that blanket came down, and the church got their eyes off of the miracle worker, listen to me carefully, and onto each other and started picking on one another's faults. Now, if you remember the teaching that I taught several weeks ago about when Jesus came to his disciples and says, you know, didn't I, this is Carrie paraphrased, boys, didn't I lay hands on you? And didn't I give you authority over every illness, every sickness, leprosy, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. He says, what happened to the power I gave you? I'm paraphrasing. Okay. It's in Mark 9. And he says, what were you arguing amongst yourself on the way? And they said, we were arguing over who was the greatest. And the reason that revival waned and began to shut down like all revivals do is the people get their eyes off of God and put them on each other. And then they start criticizing, blaming one another why things aren't working. How many know that we are a family? Not everybody born in your family is somebody that's as charming as me. <laughs> so we are all family, but there are times that we'll be disagreeing and stuff like that. But what God wants us to do is stay focused on him. Keep our eyes off of judging one another and criticizing one another. Can you say amen? All right. God taught us some time ago, probably six years, and he taught us to put our eyes on who? Come on, put, it, put our eyes on him. But it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. Now, I believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we to look to Jesus, he is the focal point of everything the Father is and everything the Holy Spirit does. He says to Philip, Jesus did, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So our job as Christians is to walk with the Lord and get as much from God as he reveals to us. That means we have to have a humble heart. Can you say amen? God doesn't pal around 
busybodies and it doesn't pal around people that think too much of themselves. Although God doesn't want us to really be prideful, does he? He wants us to be humble. Say amen, somebody. So there, yeah, there you go. You're learning. And as we continue on, I want to share with you, this is just a preliminary. We haven't even really got started. Eyes on Jesus, eyes off of the world. The reason why we don't look at the world system, because it's failing. It's failing. And if you know anything about the Bible, the Bible says in the last days, the serpent's going to go in and destroy all kinds of godly basic principles like our schools, government, hello, going in and corrupting it. Now, remember the devil's crazy. He can't think clearly. So the people that listen to him appear, what, crazy, and they can't seem to reason properly. Hello, have you seen the new math? Crazy. <laughs> it's as old as the devil himself. You see, Satan is a mosquito vampire type person. So he challenges you to try to irritate you the moment you get up in the morning. That's why you go to meet with God so that doesn't happen. Now you might say, well, that doesn't happen to me. You wait. You'll have your day. See, that when we get to thinking, I'm this, and it doesn't happen to me, and it doesn't, you're setting yourself out for some juicy little slap around the devil's going to give you. We humble ourselves every day so that there isn't anything the devil could use against us. Say amen. All right, so our eyes are off the world system. Don't look at the world. It will discourage you. Eyes off of other people. Why don't we put our eyes on other people? Because it's real easy to see other people's faults. It's sometimes real easy to deify people. Do you know we have a hero syndrome? People like heroes? Sure. You want me to be your hero, don't you? No, I hope not. One-legged, two-toed man, you know, preaching the gospel. And I'm loving every minute of giving you the word of God. But you see, we don't want a hero worship. We want a Jesus worship. And so... People have a tendency to look at other people to see how they're doing. How many know you can't be watching other people to regulate how you think you're doing? Or to go and, and try to please people so that you feel better at yourself. Here's a trick. The enemy wants you to think that when you feel good and when you're happy and all things are going good, you're in the spirit. You can be in the spirit and you have flu. Hello. It isn't the outward stuff that you're feeling. It's the inward tranquility of our relationship with God. Can you say, so eyes off of other people. Because people make mistakes. People mean well, but they can be wrong. So we go to God instead. Say amen. And then the last thing we keep our eyes off, and this is the danger zone, ourself. Please don't bring yourself to church. Bring your spirit. Bring your soul that wants to learn. But leave the crabby boo-boo either in your car at home. Can you say amen? And again, we teach you and we want you to know that church is kind of like a drinking, an artesian drinking well. You don't want people stomping around, stirring up the mud and throwing junk in the pool. No baby roots. Okay? So when the church is all stirred up and nobody's at peace, nobody's focused, and nobody getting anything out of it. When everybody's focused, we're all tranquil, we're focused in the love and God and preaching, and our eyes are off ourselves. Now, we did talk about that. There's two kinds of pride. There's a positive pride and a negative pride. This is very important. This is a preliminary. The negative pride is depression. There's chemical depression and there's regular depression. The key is you can only know that you're depressed when your focus is on who? You. So it's dangerous to have a, a bout with depression. I know I've been that way. And God said to me one time, he says, what are you doing? He says, I'm busy feeling sorry for myself and, 
and focusing on what's wrong with my life. And he says, exactly. You're supposed to be dead, son. You're supposed to die out so I can live on in you. See, die out to your flesh. Bring it before the Lord and let it be a living sacrifice. Don't bring it to church. This is not a laundry mat to wash your dirty diapers. This is a filling station to fill up on God. Can you say amen? Education station where you're being trained and taught. Amen. So you can go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Are you with me? So eyes off of the world system, eyes off of other people, eyes off of ourself, because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And inside your spirit where God lives today, because you're born again, there's not one sin or anything wrong. All your mistakes comes from the flesh. That's why God says crucify it on a daily basis. Your pride, your anger, your selfishness, all comes from the flesh because of the nature of the fallen one in us. So we take it before the Lord and we lay it at his charge. Can you say amen? All right, getting the most from your walk. In this session, we're going to show you how to get the most from your walk and absorb every day the fullness that God wants you to experience. This key, the key is to focus on Jesus Christ and to be, everyone get ready, humble. Meeting with him consistently. Let's look at our, our scripture now. You ready? It says, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life and my lips shall praise you. Do we have another page? Thus will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. And my soul shall be satisfied with the marrow and the fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Now, folks, the marrow in your bone, what does it do? The marrow in your bone, it produces the blood and, and the cells. The life in the blood, in the marrow. So when it says that, you know, marrow and fatness, it's not talking about your bones. It's talking about your spirit being healthy, full of God, full of life. Amen. Because it's the God in you that's producing the life for you daily, isn't it? Didn't we ask God to get into our heart and to help us with our walk? Yes, we did. So he's the marrow in there. He's the fatness of our life. So we should develop a real rich life with him. Can you say amen? So as we read on, the scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that you have need of will be added unto you. Seek first what? His kingdom. Everyone say kingdom is. Dominion, power, and authority. Okay. Every time you read the word kingdom of God, dominion, power, influence, or authority. That's all it means. So, God's desire is to give us his kingdom, power, dominion, and authority. Can you say amen? All right. So, as we read on, it says, so we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let me ask you this question. Can any of us in this room do good enough to save ourselves? No. no. So the righteousness he's talking about is making peace with God and asking God to forgive you and accepting God into your heart. He becomes our righteousness. Are you with me? In other words, we are righteous and loved by God because God is in our hearts. Now, God loved us before. But he couldn't get us to settle down or sit still. Even though you might be like my wife, who was a saint when she was born. <laughs> Never had any problems going out and doing the weird things. You know, and, and kind of just passed from one side over to the other without stirring up things like with the drugs and all the stuff that I went through. But you know what? We need to know that time when we accept Jesus Christ and know that God will never leave us. 
And we have to focus on the idea that we are a vessel that carries God around. Can you say amen? And that people should know you for that reason. They should know that you are with God and God is in you and that you carry God around. Just because of the behavior of your life now. Say amen. All right. So we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice in order so they get out of the weight as it's required for us. And to do that, we just simply, you just say it with your words. Lord, I lay myself down at your altar. Lord, I ask you to crucify the ugly part of my flesh. And Lord God, get it, get it ready so that when I walk through the day, I walk from my heart, from the inside man out. I don't walk from the outside man in. You see, before I was saved, I walked by emotions and feelings, whatever I saw and heard. That's the outside in. But when I got born again, I realized that God Almighty lives in me now. Now I need to live from the inside. Everyone, come out from the inside out. That takes a little slowing down a bit and concentrating on who's operating. You have three sections. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. Don't let your body rule you. You rule your body. It's an instrument. You don't get up and play with your phone or your computer and it comes up and it says, I'm not going to listen to you today. <laughs> well, your body will do that if you don't get it crucified every day. It will cop an attitude or it will begin to think things it shouldn't. That's why you can't trust it. That's why it's not going to heaven. So you got that. Say, I got that part. All right. So to please God, we should walk by faith. So go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at two verses, 9 and 10. I'm going to read it from the King James and then the Amplified. So follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 9 and 10. Therefore, we make it our aim. It's our purpose, whether to be present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all before, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether that be good or bad. Now, folks, you don't realize that the moment you close your eyes, you'll be either, you'll be, all of you are saved. So you'll be in heaven. So when you close your eyes at death or at the rapture, you open your eyes, you're going to be standing right before Jesus. Your big brother, the one who died for your sin. And you're going to have to give an, now listen to me carefully. You're going to have to give an account of your life. It's all going to flash like a video film right in front of you. Now listen carefully. If you're sinning and living an ungodly life, you won't be there. You'll be somewhere else. But for us, even us that make lots of mistakes, because we all do, we'll go right up at the moment of death or resurrection. We'll go right up, stand before Jesus. And Jesus will be loving us and caring, and now our life will go right before us. Not our old life, our Christian life. Since we were saved and what we did or did not do through our Christian life. Hello? This is a very sobering thing I'm telling you. Because then from now on, now that you know this, you don't want the bad to have to answer for. We're not talking sin here. We're talking the stubbornness of our flesh. Let me give you an example because it's hard to filter this out. We're there to give an answer for what we've done good and bad, correct? So what is the bad, Pastor Kerry? That's when God asked you to do something and you refused. What's he do? You just don't get a reward for it. Oh, you're not going to, he's not going to send you back to the first base. <laughs> Hello? No. And if he's asked you to do this and you've refused, no reward for it. And then if he says, don't do this and you did it, you didn't do it, then you get a reward. So everything you did out of love for others or for others in love of God, you get a reward. These are all good things, 30, 60, and 100 fold. 
But everything that we didn't do, or all the time that we wasted, we won't get anything. You're not going to get punished for it. This is not a punishment place. This is a, a, an accountability place. This is why pastors always told you that be accountable to God every day. Ask God how you're doing. Check up. Get a check up from the neck up. Make sure that everything's going good so that if there is some bad areas, you can pray for a crop failure. Lord, that other day when I told you I didn't want to do it, I changed my mind. I'm going to do it anyway. Bing! So we all stand before God to give an account of what we did for him and what we did for ourselves. Now, again, I have to take a little time because I can sense. So you're not in heaven because you've sinned. You're in there because you have Jesus in your heart. Can you say amen? And he wants to reward you because you love him and his son. So he's going to gather up all the good things and reward you for them. And gather up all the things you didn't do, you should have done. And just toss them out, wipe the tears from my eyes. He says, there will be some tears in heaven. But once he wipes the tear from your eyes, you're not going to have any more sadness or joy. or uh, I mean, sadness or negativity. You'll have nothing but joy and full peace and everything. But you'll realize that, gosh, I could have done better. I just didn't. So now that we know this ahead of time, let's do better. Let's ask God to help us more. Amen. Remember, we can't do it on our own. We have to have help with God. Without God, we can do nothing. And I am nothing without God. So once we got that down, we'll be okay. All right, so let's get into this thing. All right, 2 Corinthians 5, again, 9. Therefore, make it our aim, whether to be present or absent, would be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now listen to it in the Amplified. An Amplified Bible is taking it, matching it up with the Greek and or the Hebrew, and bringing out the full meaning. So it has more words in it. So listen to this. Same verse but from uh, the Amplified. Therefore, whether we are at home on the earth or away from home and with him, it is our con constant ambition to be pleasing to him. For we, believers, that will be called to account what has been done in our body, whether it be good or whether it be bad, that is, each will be held responsible for his own actions, purposes, goals, and motives, the use or misuse of them, and the time appointed to ease to compare to what God's asked you to do. Whoa! Amplified, I'd say. But the idea behind it all is try to be the most obedient child that you can. It is tough for some of us because we've never been like this before. We've never walked with God we, we might have been religious we might have gone to church or something. maybe we did maybe we didn't but now it's a real walk with God think about it when I was in high school I got picked on a lot because I was small in statue my freshman year I got hung up by my belt on a locker swinging from the locker when the bell rang <laughs> principal had to lift me off the locker but so, you know, bullies are like that. They'll come by and they'll see the young kid and they'll bang him in the shoulder and say, yeah, hey, I'll be looking for you. That's the devil, okay? Back to school. One of the things I did after that happened is I surrounded myself with big guys. The little guy had the big guys. So if anybody picked on a little guy, I would sick the big guys on them. Guess what? They left me alone. And not only that, but I had quite a little following when I was in high school. Too bad I didn't know where I was going. <laughs> Hello. I mean, I had the gift of gab. And when people, when I would throw a party, we'd have 100 people show up. In South Prairie? That's pretty suspicious. Anyway, <laughs> but with the whole idea behind all of that is when you're walking around with God, who is going to pick on you? 
No, it's when the enemy pulls you away from fellowshipping with God into your own abilities and your own figurings. When you know you should be doing something and you're not doing it, that's when he comes around. Hello. No, purpose in your heart that you're going to be walking with God through the rest of your life. Can you say amen? And you know what that's going to do to the devil? It's going to very much intimidate him. And he's going to wait until you start getting out on your own. But I don't plan on doing that. Do you plan on doing that? We plan on walking with God the rest of our days, don't we? All right, bless your heart. So we will cover today dun, 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 four things. Number one, no more guilt and condemnation. If you're having guilt and condemnation, we need you to teach you and you need to pay attention. Because Jesus removed all guilt and condemnation even when you make a mistake. God does not condemn you. Anybody can quote me John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the second verse 17 says for God did not send. Now listen carefully. His son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. So this condemning and this, these prophets and all, are, they're all criticizing and coming against each other. That's not God. None of it is. Because God is not in the condemning business during the time of grace. He's in the saving business. And if you want to shut somebody's ears off, go ahead and pull uh, their fault first. And then try to share good news with them. First thing I do when I get up in the morning and I address you as your pastor, I call you all a bunch of jerks. Now, are you going to receive anything more I have to say? Of course not. The preaching, adorning the preaching of the gospel is making it beautiful like Jesus. So people want to know God. What Satan has done, he's got a lot of guilt and condemnation being preached. Hello? If you don't straighten out, God's going to get you, sister. Smile up and say, he already did. You see, you see how the, the intimidator, the bully tries. He wants to hang you up on the locker. But see, if you're not thinking about yourself and you're in tune with God, he can't touch you. He can't touch you. It's only when you're hanging out too much doing your own thing that he can mess with you. Say, oh me. All right. So we also become no more guilt, no more condemnation. Number two. The humble of heart enjoys God's provisions. That's the second thing we're going to cover today. The humble of heart enjoys God's provision. Being, the third thing is being quick to hear and slow to speak. How many know that uh, inserting the foot in thy mouth is not a good thing? And then the fourth thing we'll cover, hopefully, is allow the patience of God, God in us. To have his perfect work. Now see when James wrote the book of James. He's talking to Jews. Jews now listen. I love them. But they had no concept in the Old Testament. Of God coming and living in us. None. So when you talk. <coughs> God. Excuse my coughing. When you talk God to the Israelites. They, they understand the fear of God. They understand do God, do what God asks or else. But they never understood the concept of God coming and living in them. So when James is writing, he's writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. They're all being panicked because Nero is in office. Remember Nero? He fiddled while Rome burned. He lit it on fire himself and blamed it on the Christians so he could crucify them. The guy was only 30 years old. He got into ruling when he was a teenager. And he hated Christians and Jews. He's a type of antichrist anyway. Amen. So Nero did that. And he did it for three and a half years. Kind of like the antichrist is going to do during the tribulation. Anyway, moving right off of that. So let's get into this, right? First thing is I want you to know as a Christian... God does not hand out any guilt. He has no condemnation. 
He will never condemn you. He will always do his best to build you up and to encourage you. Now, does God correct us? Yes, but he always corrects us in love, hoping that we will turn and change to become better. God is not a mean guy that drinks a lot, and every time you get out of line, he's going to smack you. <laughs> We've all had experiences with things like that. No, God is totally loving and totally caring, but he's got to get our undivided attention. Amen. And you know what? We are creatures of easily distractions. You know, I can't worship because there's a little glitch in the worship. Yeah, yeah, it shows you how you're. And listen, here's another one. God wants me to say this. So I'm going to say it. Get your eyes off of, of revival as being causing people to move and, and wiggle. God says, and this is my word to you, so it's on tape. What you do not know, saith the Lord, is I am getting ready for a great move of my spirit. I am calling those that are listening and watching to me. And I'm calling them to me so I can prepare their hearts and get them ready. And there is a great move of my spirit all throughout the world right now. But it is not an outward move. It's an inward move till the time that I will display my power and my glory in Jesus' name. Somebody in here thinks the only time there's revival is when people are hopping around and jumping and doing all that. No, no, no. Revival starts in our heart first. Making sure that we are in tune with God so we're not left out when God moves. Can you say amen? Not say oh me. <laughs> you say, well, what was that thing you just did? That's called prophecy. Okay, and if you need to know more about that, don't be afraid of it because God is in me. He's in you. Once in a while wants to speak himself. So we want to be open to prophetic words. Can you say amen? All right, go with me. No more guilt, no more condemnation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 21. Some of you know this one by heart. I call this a great exchange. Your unrighteousness for God's righteousness. Look what it says, verse 21. For he made him, Jesus, for the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin... To become sin for us, that we might become by accepting him, the righteousness of God in him. So everyone say, in Christ I'm righteous. In Christ, I'm righteous. In Christ I do the right things. In Christ I think the right, right way. Outside of Christ, yes. <laughs> you know, I won't go anywhere on that part. So you are the righteousness of God because you have Jesus in you. That's the reason why you're saved. Not by any goodness or not goodness, but because you have Jesus in your heart. Say amen. Now, the second part of that scripture I want to give you is in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 1 and 2. Romans chapter 8 under the no more guilt, no more condemnation. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now. Now that you're born again, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So guess what? God's never going to condemn you. Even when you do something wrong, will God condemn you? No, because you're his child. You're his child. You're no longer a servant. You're his child. And you can serve, but you're his child first. So God doesn't beat his kids. You're in God dwelt. Why would he beat himself or the vessel that carries him around? No, he corrects us with his word and with our prayer meeting with him. That's how God changes us and corrects us. Amen. Despise not the chastening of the Lord, it says, or get irritated when God exercises you in it. How many know that God is far wiser than any of us? So we realize, got to realize that God is not going to give us any guilt. All guilt and condemnation comes either from your flesh or from Satan. Or I can even say this, I will, other people. Remember Job's comforters? They say, Job, you're, getting, you're doing all this stuff because you have secret sin in your life. I had a guy, told, I had a guy tell me that one time. I had to laugh at him. He came in and he says, you've got sin in the camp. I says, what else is new? 
So we're all sinners saved by grace. Now we're children of God. So we've had lots of problems. See, we want to always go back to the Old Testament and put guilt on somebody. Here's the old Pentecostal guilt altar call. I know that you people have things you have to deal with, secret things you're holding on to. And if I start talking that way, what's that? I'm, I mean, I'm talking out of guilt, making you feel guilty. God never does that. What he does is right in the middle of your being a nasty person, he'll say something like, I love you. What are you doing? And you go, <laughs> and you break all apart. He doesn't scream at you, yell at you. You see, all of that is religious false teachings. I mean, for a Christian to say, I think God has left me. Man, you better read your Bible, Sonny. God said, I will never leave you. You might push him aside a little bit, but he's still there. That's why you feel miserable. You're under conviction. Everyone say, I need to know what conviction is. And what condemnation. So let me explain. When God convicts us of something, there is no condemnation or guilt with it. And how does he do that? Well, you're reading along in your Bible and suddenly you read a thing and it says, I want you to pray. And I want you to seek my face early. And you haven't been doing that. And suddenly you go, okay, Lord. That's called a conviction. There's a desire now that God has spoken to you, you want to change. There's no guilt added with it. There's no sorrow. There's no condemnation. You just know that you need to do that. Hello. Now, if you don't do that, it'll get louder and the conviction will get stronger. And it'll go for a short time. Now, listen to me carefully. Don't you miss a thing I'm saying. It'll go for a short time and then it'll stop. And then you'll go into the second stage of your misery. <laughs> Because you didn't listen to the first stage for him to get you out. You see, we got to be listening to God. we got to be focused on God. So he's our shepherd. And one scripture says we follow after his heels. We follow after him at his heels. At his heels. So we, he doesn't lose us. Can you say amen? So going back to what I was saying is, we need to realize that in Romans chapter 8, listen, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That's you and I. Who do not walk according to your flesh, but according to your spirit. That's the inner man. We walk from the inside out, not from the outside in. Now listen to this next phrase. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that's where we're at has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, the law of sin and death is in your body. The law, the Old Testament, listen, the Old Testament was written to let us know that we can't save ourselves because the law of sin and death are in our body. So even though we want to be good and we try to be good, Paul says, I can't be good. Oh, wretched man that I am. So you go to God and God makes it good. God crucifies your flesh, and God does all that. So this next phrase, it says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So there's no condemnation. You make a mistake, get up. Don't sit around and go, why, why, why? Oh, come, oh, come, oh, come. Get up. Even kids know when they fall in the mud puddle not to stay there. They run to mommy. Hello. But as adults, we sit in our misery. I'm really wrong with that. All right, moving right along. A couple of points. Once we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become a child of God, no longer a sinner saved by grace. And guilt and sin have been removed from our spirit. Your flesh will have plenty of guilt and plenty of things to blame. When God confronted Adam when he had sinned, he says, have you eaten of the tree? And he says, it was the woman you gave me, God. Blaming and not accepting personal responsibilities. Remember, God cleanses you instantly. Don't sit around and have to feel real sorry so you think you have to repent. I got to feel real bad so I really, when I repent, I really repent. 
What a bunch of boobs thinking. That's just awful. You know how I get forgiven? Father, give me. Then I release it and forget about it. I don't want to spend time thinking about what I could have, should have, did have. You know what I mean? I made a mistake. I am totally sorry, God. Let him make up the difference and stop you. Lord, I didn't tie this week. I'm going to tie twice as much next week. Don't do that. No, if you want to, I'll accept it. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Don't, don't make deals with God. Just surrender every day and say, Lord, it's because you live in me and my life is worth living. You get that and your life will, half of your problems will be gone because you're not dwelling on yourself. Moving right along, Pastor Gary. Okay, so for us to receive all the benefits in Christ that we need, we have to walk from our new man, from the inside out. That means that we have to be aware. We have to be awake. Be alert and sober. And I'm not talking, we think sober means not drinking, but it, what it means is an alert mind that's aware. Hello. Amen. In fact, God picked Gideon's army from the people that were aware as versus the people that were lapping up water because they, they needed the water. No, be aware of your times. Be aware of your relationship with God. Be aware of who is in you. Be aware of what you have as a believer. Be aware of your covenant with God. And just in that alone will give you such great joy. Can you say amen? You know what happens to a lot of people who get good word like this? is you begin, to, your life begins to come to, let me ask you, Sherry, has, since you've been coming and everything, not to brag on anything, but just the word, your life has been coming together so good, so wonderful, it almost has given you this false sense of peace that you don't have a battle every day, you're not freaked out. That's what the word does in our heart. But the old person that we used to be has a tendency to want to stop there and take a vacation. That's when the enemy gets his counterattack in. Now listen, if you're in a battle, not for your soul, but the souls of others and Satan wants to disturb your peaceful walk, then you should be alert and be aware that that's his goal. But you're going to pal up with so much with God that he can't get in anywhere near you because you're surrounded, you're filled, you're have the armor, you have the name, you have the blood, you have all these things. Satan has to wait until you get into yourself to even attack you. So that just tells us, if you're being under a lot of attack, you are living for yourself too much. Ooh, that was a tough one to deliver. But it's the truth. We're living for ourselves too much. Don't, I, if you're going to mow your lawn, mow it in Jesus. If you're going to go to work, go to work in Jesus. Lord, so you and I, let's make some parts. You got a, you got a, something that you got, it's going to work on for a couple of days. Do it in Jesus. It'll be the best couple of days. God will show you the better ways to do it. Oh, I just love that. Oh, Lord, I feel so helpless sometimes when I'm in front of you. And God says, that's why I'm here, son. You and me together, you're yoked up with me. So let's partner. We don't think like that like we should. We need to do that more and more. Someone say, oh, me. All right. So let's go on to my second point. No more guilt. So if somebody starts sending you guilt, telling you you should have, you could have, or if you feel guilty, you know where that's coming from. You can bind it, rebuke it, and take authority over it. Don't dwell on it. Amen? Listen, if you've got stinky socks, don't dwell in them. Change them. Point two. The humble in heart receives the benefits of God. God says the Spirit of God resists the proud, but give grace to the yeah, the humble person gets the goodies. 
not the loud mouth, not the mighty spiritual rebuker and all that. No, the humble, gentle person. And I see one right over here. This lady right over here. Your ma is so gentle and so careful. Just look at the blessings God has done. Did she earn it? No. Just being humble, God wants to just do it. So we have a lot to be thankful for, but to remember, we have to stay humble. So it takes that time with God to keep us humble because our flesh likes to rise up. It likes to argue. Hello? Likes to have its way. All right. Have you got my second point? So the humble in heart receives God's provisions. Luke chapter 14, please. Verse 7 through 11. That's funny. How am I doing on time? Good? All right. So, he told a parable to those who were invited. When he... I got it. My eyes got to focus. When he noted that they had chose the best places, saying to them... Now, here's... They're having a potluck. They're having a love feast. They're having a, a, a banquet. So this is what he said, verse 8. When you are invited to, by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place. So that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. What are you doing sitting here? Come on over here. You see, we humble ourselves, but God invites us up. Do you see how that works? We don't false humble. This, let me show you what false humble is. Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm just ugly. I'm a terrible person. That's not humble. That's sin. Don't ever say that. You say, Lord, I'm just a humble man. I want to stay humble. So I humble myself. Even if you haven't got a good picture saying it, God realizes that you want to be humble. Hello. But it's the false humility. I'm worthless. I'm never going to be anything. It never works for me. That's an insult to God. You're actually spitting in his face. Because you're his child. And to say something like that is full ignorance gone to seed. So don't ever say that anymore. If you have, shut it down. Because you're God's child and he loves you. He sent his son to die for you. So you are special. So you take your specialness and you go to God and you say, God, kill everything that doesn't please you. And cause the inside of me to live like I'm supposed to. See that shell you have is your body. That's what Adam gave you. God never gave you that body. Adam gave you that body. And that body is full of the nature of Satan. That's why you age and get sick. That's why some people are born challenged. Blind or deaf. Why some people can, can't do certain things. Because of Adam's sin passed into our gene structure, which creates flaws. But you and I, we're not living by this body any longer. We're living by our heart and our spirit. Can you say amen? And this body should serve us. Say amen? This body should serve you and Jesus Christ in you. Moving right by on. Okay, so... And he says, but when you are invited, sit down where? In the lowest place. Now, I don't consider that church. I think if you're coming to church, you should sit down in the front pews. And the people sitting in the back just imagine sinners. <laughs> Not really. We all, why do we? Well, Carrie, you're so loud. I have to sit way back here. But not in the, in the parking lot. Moving right along. Are you with me? So, if you want benefits from God, we have to be. If we want benefits from God, we'll have to be. 
So your prayer is, Lord, teach me how to be humble the way you desire it. Not what I feel humble is. Are you with me? Amen. And so we want to, we want to look at that. So instead of being embarrassed, make yourself of no reputation and be humble and let people invite you up. You've gone to visit a church, you want to be involved in the church, don't come in like gangbusters and tell everybody what you do. That is absolutely not humble. Sit down and for a couple of weeks, don't even tell anybody you do anything. Show your faithfulness, you see. And we always do it backwards. And we wonder why things aren't working. So move on right along. Look at to what Matthew 23, verse 11 and 12 says. But it, but he who is greatest among you should be your servant. This is Matthew 23, 11 and 12. The greatest one among you should be the servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself, God will exalt you. And we got it? You start promoting yourself, telling everybody who you are and what you do and what you can. And you're going to eat humble pie for a while. Because you've been promoting yourself and didn't even know it. Don't promote yourself. Let God the Father promote you by being humble. And God said, look at what he did. Remember Job? Remember the Job, the book of Job? God, when Satan was right up in front of God, God says, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the world. He's a great man. God never says one bad thing about you. And especially to the devil. Job was messing up terribly. He married the world. His children were hearty parties. Drank and boozed it. He was fearful over his cattle. And his lands. So everything he was afraid of. Satan had an opening to attack him with. And he opens his mouth and he says. I wasn't just a little afraid. I was greatly afraid. And everything he was afraid for got attacked. A message to us. Everything you're in fear about, Satan will use to attack. So put everything in the altar in the hands of God. And if you start finding yourself concerned or worry, say, Lord, I cast it over on you. Not, I'm not going to carry it around. Because I can't do anything about it anyway. And worrying about it is just going to open the door to the devil. So we're not going to do that. Can you say amen? Are you learning, sis? Yes. Okay, so. We have to be humble. Amen. My third point. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. Here's the funny thing. Have you ever seen somebody who talks too much? Everybody's laughing. Have you ever been, don't raise your hand, in a condition where maybe you, you should have shut up a half an hour ago and kept on talking? I've been there. I have the gift of gab, remember? God had to get a hold of this. And I could talk up a storm and often did. I mean, literal storms. Listen, we have to be quick to hear and slow to speak. How many ears, how many ears do you have? How many mouths? That's the ratio. Listen twice as much as you do talking. Why? Because it's not what goes in a man that defileth the man. It was what comes out of the man. And he's not talking about food there. He's talking about your words. It's the bad words and the things that you say that are contrary to God that defile you. How did you get saved? Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sin. Bing, you were changed. How do we get changed back? Oh, I'm a nothing. I'll never amount to anything. Blah, 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 blah. Zap. Now, you don't stop being saved. and You don't stop. You're just out of fellowship. I have a little story I tell a lot. I have a son, he's a wonderful man, and he, he is up in age now, but when he was younger, I bought him a bike, one of these really hot rod stingray things, and, 
everything. And he had it parked next to my new car. Okay. Brand new Honda car. And, you know, of course, everything, you know, it's just, just and he's just a kid. I said, when you get your bike out of there, son, be careful because I don't want you scratching the car. Well, he picked the bike up and the car, the bike went smack, put a big old dent in the car. Now, did he stop becoming my son? He was just out of fellowship. <laughs> That's how God looks at you. When you make a mistake, he doesn't throw you away. You're out of fellowship. You have to restore that fellowship by saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I made a boo-boo. And God says, no problem. Let's go. Notice God don't sit around, wrap his arm around you and go, yeah, let's cry together. Yeah, you're such a turkey. I know. <laughs> no, let's get up. Let's go. The sitting around feeling sorry is a trick. Come on, remember when you were a kid? If you were like me, my folks did not like to take me to the store, especially have toys in it. <laughs> Tantrumism. And you know, adults do tantrumisms. Sure, if you don't get your own way. Moving right along. I don't want to meddle. I'm, I'm, I'm into preaching, not meddling. But you get to know yourself a little better. Die out to the part you don't like about yourself. One brother said to me, you know, I don't like myself. I said, I don't like myself either. He says, you don't? I says, no, my flesh I don't like. It's ugly. And so this is just a tool. So therefore I take it, bathe it, feed it, do what it needs to do. But I don't listen to it with counsel. I don't let my flesh tell me what to do. Can you say amen, somebody? Amen, somebody. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. Look at Proverbs 1, verse 33. He says, but whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without any fear of evil. Wow. How many listeners to God do we have? James 1, 19 and 20 says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, which will cause you to be slow to anger. For the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. So you can see the separation. If you find yourself getting upset easily, that's not the spirit. That's the flesh. If you find yourself wanting to tell a little fib or shun somebody, that's your flesh. Recognize that that entity of your flesh has a grave to go to. Or if we're going to be raptured, we'll be changed. But this, this mouthy thing is not going in its condition. So don't give it the time you've been given in it. Crucify it before the Lord daily by saying, Lord, crucify my flesh. I lay it down at your charge. And Lord God, when I get up from prayer here, that it will be pressed clean and ready to go. Can you say amen? And then he puts it on you with his anointing in it. A couple of points I want to give to you. Number one, have we ever noticed we have two ears and one mouth, but we often do a lot of speaking? We need to listen more because sometimes we miss the important things. Two, when we talk, we can't listen. If we're listening, don't talk because the moment you talk, your brain will listen. So people that talk all the time don't receive much because they're talking all the time and their brain is listening to what they're saying and they're focusing and they're trying to concentrate that. If that's you, stop doing that. Just talk when you need to talk, give praise to God, and then ask God to sort out your thinking. Don't speak things that just come to your mind. Just don't speak things that just come to your mind. Because Satan has access to your mind too. And can drop a little dew drop in there. Saying you're not worthy. And then, then point out something that happened yesterday. Somebody did something kind of made you think twice. And then he goes. Yeah yesterday. See I told you they are like that. 
How many know that nobody's always like that and nobody's never ever this and never that always, we're all subject to change, can you say amen? And we're all getting better, amen. right? Okay, so be quick to hear and slow to speak. Listen to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 32 through 35. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways, hear my instruction, then be wise and do not disdain it. In other words, or do not reject my words to you. Okay. Then it goes on, blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor of the Lord. Say, that's me. Are you a good listener? Or is your mind wandering when the Bible's being taught? If you need to control that mind. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. You really do. All right, so let's go on and look at this. The last point. Let patience, Jesus in you, God in you, have his perfect work. How many know that we come up to situations in life that really we can't do a thing about them? So who, who do we go to? We talk to God about it. Now, who could do something about it? God. So we lean on God to do the things we can't. God leans on us to do the things he asks so that God be glorified in our life throughout the rest of our years. Can you say amen? You're a beautiful person. You're wonderfully and fearfully made. God has designed you in such a great way, but the enemy has worked all your life to try to keep you from understanding who you really are and how God really loves you and the eternity he's created for you. He's got eternity for you and I. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? Now listen, James chapter 1, verse 2 through 5. Let patience or God in us have his perfect work. All right, verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you come against various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, who tests our faith? Satan does. God doesn't test your faith. Doesn't he know everything? So God doesn't tempt you. God doesn't test you. God's not going to put you through the mud, the crud, or the flood. He's in you. The tempter, the tester is Satan. He wants to see where your faith is at. So he pokes you a couple of times because you're in the flesh just to see what you're believing. How are you believing? I'm certainly hoping. You got to believe, act, believed, and act, trust. Amen. Say, that's me. So he goes on, my brother, encounter all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let me put it into modern language. Causes God to work. The moment you go under a trial, God is working mightily in you. Let him have his way. Hello? Because it's going to say in a minute here, allow patience to have her perfect work. So when you're under trial, instead of figuring out why, just go to God and let God pull you out of it. Hello? Harold Hill was a wonderful man. He wrote a couple of books. One book was kind of live like a king's kid. He was on a jet airplane, and the engines went out. So instead of him going, what are we going to do with all the other panic people? He stands up. It's in this book. He stands up and says, graduation day. I get to go to heaven. Everybody else is crying and stuff because they don't have their self right with God. He's going, yeah, graduation day. Hallelujah. And the engines fired back up. And God, like said, not today. You see, when nothing intimidates you and forces you into fears and stuff, then you're beginning to mature. You're beginning to separate the resources speaking to you. Which one's of God and which is not. 
Say amen. amen. But let patience, God in us, have his perfect work. Now listen to what it says. His perfect work. Is God perfect? Does he want you to move you into perfection or maturity? Yes, he does. He didn't want to leave you the way you are now, even though you're wonderful. He wants you to keep going and learning and keep enjoying him. Let patience have her perfect work. Let God have his perfect work in you that you be lacking nothing. Now, let me see the hands. Since you begin meeting with God in the morning and being faithful with him, how God has put your, let me see, how, let me see the hands of you. Your life has been put in order now because of that very thing. Because you're letting God run your life and you're not doing it. And you surrender to God daily and you say, take over and run. I'm going to just follow you through the day. We're going to have fun together. It says to work out your own salvation with fear and trouble. It says to work it out with God. You and God working together to get you off of here. You're in a rescue program. So you got to be a good listener. Don't speak so much. Follow God. Be awake. Be alert. Say amen, somebody. Amen. But you need to let God in you have his perfect work so he can bring you to perfection. Stop taking over the steering wheel. Excuse me, God, you're driving too slow. Our body and our flesh does not want someone else running our life. But we need to surrender and realize that God knows more how to run our life than we do. And if we would just admit that and say, God, help me. He says, all right, we'll do it together and I'll show you the ropes. That's where it comes to becoming exciting. I remember when I first got saved, God said, I'm going to do great things with you. About three and a half months in, I, was, I went and applied to the natural resources, uh, being a fire, fireman for the, for the state, DNR. And the first thing that I got sent to do was to fight a forest fire in Colville. And man, I'm a, just a baby in the Lord, but God says, I'm going to use you mightily over there. And man, things started happening. I says, well, it's you and me, God, mostly you and me, God. And I can tell you, sometime I like to sit down with you and share all the miracles that happened when I didn't even know what a miracle really was. When I showed up at the fire, a three-headed snake came right out of the, out of the atmosphere. Satan came right up and threatened me right out of the blue, 2.30 in the morning. I got my paper sleeping bag and my sack lunch ready to kill a fire. And now we got to sleep for two hours. So I'm heading up where we're all sleeping. And the snake came right up and three headed and came right at me and says, you're going to die. You're not going to go anywhere. And I looked at that and I went, huh, I must be tired. Went up, slept. You see, when you're in God, what the devil threatens you with is not a reality. He wants it to become a reality by having you act on that. So I went to sleep, woke up, and you know what? Over a hundred people gave their hearts to the Lord through that entire time that I was there. And God used this person here who didn't know very much. But I did know how to lead somebody to the Lord. Didn't know how to pray for the sick because my pastor taught us all that. All right, so listen, we need to let God have control of our vehicle. Hello? How many's ever called an Uber? You see, when somebody else is driving, you can notice more. You ever notice that? Like when we went to Montana, you didn't have to drive, you didn't have to be looking for direction. I just drove. You could see moose, crosses on sides of hills. You could be watching all around you. This is what I'm telling you. Let God take control of your life and do the driving. You sit and do what he's asked you to do along the journey, but don't get worked up about things. Because being worked up about things will just slow you down. So instead, every time you start to get work, just cast it over on the Lord. Says, Lord, I'm with you. I'm in this vehicle. Amen. 
Where are we going, God? I know it's going to be good. So I'm not saying don't do things. I'm not saying be lazy. God tell you to pick up the wrench and you pick up the wrench. No, what I'm saying is he goes through your life and he filters your life. And all the things that have the bad patterns in it, bad habits in your life, the things that kept tripping you up, or maybe something, someone would say a, a trigger word, and all of a sudden you'd just be upset. God washes all that out as long as you walk through your days with him. He'll remove any anger, any frustration, any hurt, any pain, any sorrow that you might have from your past. You might still have the scar. You see, I have a scar on my wrist where my, my arm was broken. Yeah, but you know, there's no more pain. So we have scars from our past, some of us, but God has removed your pain. And there are little reminders of don't be a jerk <laughs> or don't be so silly. So you look at those things as a reminder, but you and I are walking with God. And so I would love to be able to say to each one of you, how's your walk with God going today? How are you? In it? What's going on in your prayer life? What's God been telling you? But usually the conversations are, well, I got to get through this. And man, if we just get through this Tuesday and you know, it's usually kind of things like that. Just remember, we are pushing Satan out of our lives by acting on the word and relating to God, aren't we? So he's getting less and less of hold on you. And if I can keep you here long enough and feed you as much word you want, you won't even recognize yourself in a month or two. Trouble is, we can't get you to sit still long enough. Yes, we can. So we hope to see the word of God transform us. Amen. So what are those four things that we learned today? Number one, there's no more guilt on condemnation. Any guilt, condemnation comes your way, you know where it comes from. Number two, in order for us to receive the benefits, we have to be humble. Number three, we have to be quick to and slow to because sometimes we want to inject our own humor and actually our humor is a bad joke of 40 years ago. Learn something new. And then fourthly, allow what to have is perfect work. Patience or God. God is the patience in you. How many know you don't pray for patience? You already did. You got patience in you. His name is God. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, temperance, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness all in your spirit. You can't ask for any more. It needs to develop now. It's like a fruit seed. It has to develop. So I got to get you into the presence of God and get you after word so God can grow the seed in your heart so that God in you will take over your old man or woman and that you'll shine as lights as God first promised you to be. You are the light shiners. You are the light of the world, he said, a city set on a hill. And when we were first created, we didn't have this body. We had a body of light. We were clothed in light. We were called the shining ones. God is a shining one and his angels were shining ones, except for Lucifer and his bunch, they fell. But we were originally shining ones, made in God's image after his likeness. But we fell in Adam and now we return to God. Instead of becoming shining ones again, pay attention, we become religious. Try to adapt ourselves to what the churches are doing today. Listen, this church is not going to be like the churches up the street or the ones down the street. This is going to be the church God wants to make. And I want them to have the church God tells them to make. And if we start comparing our churches with one another, we're just foolish again. No, this is a unique church and you belong to it. No membership, just come. Guaranteed, you will not be disappointed if you listen. Be humble. Realize that God is not giving you the guilt or the nastiness, even when you make a mistake. And know that you've got to let God have his perfect work. If you've got something out of that, will you give the Lord a hand clap? Amen. <laughs>